in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may arise early and go on your way. And they said, However, no, but we shall spend the night in the square. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them, and in the doorway he shut the door behind him, and he said, Please, my brothers, do not act wickedly. Behold... I have two daughters who have not had relations with men. Please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. Only do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one has come as an alien and is already acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. They struck the men where they were in the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they worried themselves trying to find the doorway. Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters, and whoever you have in this city, bring them out of this place. For we are about to destroy this place because of their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, and said, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his son-in-laws to be jesting. When morning dawned, the angel urged Lot, saying, Take up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, and you will be swept away, or you will be swept away in the judgment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand, and the hand of his wife, and the hand of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him, and they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they had brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, and do not stay where you are in the valley. Escape to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, O oh, no, my lords, now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please, let me escape there. It's not too small, that my life may be saved. He said to him, said to him Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore the name of this town was called Zor. The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew these, those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the city and what grew on the ground. But his wife, from behind, looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Here ends the scripture reading. We'd like to call on Tracy at this time to come up and give us special music. Not on yet. Now I'm on. From John 13, verses 1 through 17. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, 
not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. The song I've sang several times here, but it's just, I always look for a, another song, and God always leads me back to this one. It's titled, He Washed My Feet. So I'm going to sing it again. The moment our eyes met I knew this was the night That I would betray him The precious Lamb of God No other disciple Was aware of my plan Till he rose from the table was something in his hand His holy eyes pierced through me Revealing all my sin I knew his wrath was coming And this would be the end But he bowed and he washed my feet Knowing that I was The cause of his grief When he should have scolded He whispered peace As he bowed my feet Judas would fail him but he's no worse than I the moment I gave in to Satan's compromise ungrateful that Jesus had saved me from hell I was walking so proudly and that's when I fell His holy eyes pierced through me revealing all my sin I knew His wrath was coming and this would be the end but he bowed and he washed my feet knowing that I was the cause of his grief when he should have scolded he whispered He bowed, the king bowed, Jesus washed my feet.
I'd like to call on Caleb at this time to come up and give us devotions today. So I've written devotions tonight. Um, I try to make it about sharing the word of God. Um, here we go. In John eleven twenty five 25 through 26, it says, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. This is a great thing to hear. In this verse, God is promising us eternal life. There are so many amazing promises that God has for us that many people don't know. In Jeremiah 17, 7, it says, Blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord. We need to have faith in the Lord. He is steadfast, honorable, and he never lies. So he will keep his promises even if we don't. The astonishing thing is, no matter how greatly you have sinned, God will always forgive you. The, promise, uh, the problem with that is that some people don't know about these remarkable truths or they can't access them. We need to share God's powerful word and his wonderful promise to help others come to the truth. In Hebrews 13, 16, it says, So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? This is a reminder that we should not be scared to share the work of God. Although we might be frightened or we might struggle with the Lord, no person, no matter how strong or how weak, shall be able to hurt us. So with confidence, we should go out and make disciples, as said in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with, always with you to the very end of the age. We cannot be afraid to go and share his word to others because they hunger for it. We need to go willingly with confidence to spread the gospel and power of the Lord. So during these last weeks of Lent, I encourage you to read your Bible, the book that God has provided to us, and to look in the word for the wonderful gifts he has given and share them with others that might need it. Please join me in prayer. Dear Jesus, I pray that you would be able to help us to read through your word and to find what you want us to share. I pray that you will be able to use us to bring others to you and to bring others to know your great works. Um, I pray that you would be able to help us to bring others to church, maybe, or to youth group, or just anywhere to give them a good start or a restart. So in your name we pray, amen. Well done. Good job, Caleb. Let's sing together our song before the message, hymn number 62, Beneath the Cross of Jesus.
I'm sure we're all familiar with this portion of scripture that today's message comes from. But every time I read it in its entirety, I, I'm kind of taken back by parts of it, right? I don't comprehend all of it. But in the, the spirit of the series that we're doing or the heart of the series that we're doing of not being able to give it up, Lot's wife absolutely had a hard time not giving it up. So we're going to exhibit, exhibit, expedite, exposition, expositorily, there we go, work through the text today. In other words, we'll start at the beginning and work through. That's right. I like that face because that's exactly how I was feeling. Now, two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. Everybody familiar with who Lot is? So Lot was Abraham's nephew. So the son of his brother or sister. I can't remember if it was brother or sister, but it's his nephew. And he said, now behold, my lords. And he's speaking to the two angels. Obviously, Lot didn't know that they were angels at the time. He just thought that they were men who were coming to the, to the town. And there were times in the Old Testament when we see that angel of the Lord. <clears throat> and when that Lord is used in the uppercase, really that's saying the angel of Yahweh. And there are times when people believe that that, that person that came, that angel that came, was actually the pre-incarnate Christ. So for an example, when Jacob wrestles with an angel... There are those who believe that that angel, because it says the angel of Yahweh, that that was the pre-incarnate Christ that uh, Jacob was wrestling with. Now, these two angels, don't, that doesn't say angel of the Lord. It doesn't say anything in regards to believe any of those things that I have just stated. Though they do come with some great authority and great power. And yet... They're covered, and nobody knows where they're coming from and who they are and how much power they do actually come with. So he says to them, Behold, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet that you may rise and go on your way. And at first they say, No, but we will spend the night in the square. But Lot, he urges them strongly. So they come aside to him and enter his house, and he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom. And this word for men here uh, is more often used in the sense of distinguishing between men and women. So later on here, it does say people, right? It says, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. That word for people is referring back to this word for man. And that these are men. It's not men and women. It is men that have surrounded his house. It is men young and old. It doesn't say how young, <clears throat> but it does say young and old. And it does say from every corner. That is meaning all of those men from the entire town <clears throat> came. I don't know how big Sodom and Gomorrah was, right? I don't know if it was Milford or if it was Chicago. But I know... When all the men show up young and old, that's going to be a big representation of the town, is it not? They come to his door, they come to his quarters, and they say, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so that we may have relations with them. In the Old Testament, you will, or in the New Testament, you will never find in the original language the word homosexual or homosexuality. However, we've translated it in the newer texts, in the newer translations of Scripture, homosexual. But the actual word that's used is sodomy. The idea of homosexual relations when it's in the New Testament and it refers to that act of sodomy, the homosexual thing that is being taken place, this is what's being referred back to. Understand that. 
when the New Testament people write of homosexuality, there are places where it's listed that uh, there in 1 Corinthians where it says these will not enter the kingdom of heaven, and it's listed there. Or when Paul talks about how God gave them over to their depraved lusts that was unnatural. It's referring back. And every time what is brought to mind in that people, in that time, was Sodom. So here are all the men outside your door. Can you imagine? I'm not quite sure I'm able to place my feet in the text. I don't know what I would do. This is what Lot does. He said, please, brothers, do not act wickedly. He goes out in front of the door. He shuts the door behind him as to put himself in between them and those they seek. But then he says in verse 18, Now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with men. Please let me bring them out to you and to do whatever you would like with them. Only do nothing to these men, inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. I don't understand verse 8. No matter how hard I try. And I think it's because we live in maybe in a different culture now, right? If you can think about it, what this does is this shines a light onto Lot's position and the culture of the day. And he cared so much for those men who were supposed to be under the protection of his roof that he would rather harm come to his daughters. I'm telling you right now, if something like that were to happen in my place, I would never be able to offer up my daughters. You know, I've, I've, I've been heard saying things like if something happens to my daughters, they may never find the person's body. So how would I ever be able to offer up that? I, I don't understand it. But what it shows is the concern that Lot had and the importance it was to him that those people that he had brought into his own home to care for them, that if something were to happen to them, how he would view that. How that would be of the utmost worst thing that could happen possibly. In other words, in his mind, he says, it's better for my family, my daughters, whom he absolutely loved. You can't look at this and say, well, Lot didn't care for his children then. Man, he was just like, here you go, have these ones. Lot didn't, he, he cared for his children. But that something would happen to the children rather than to those who were under his care were, were more important. I don't know if I can comprehend that, but now I begin to see what kind of position he's in. I tell you one thing. If you were a visitor at Lot's house, you should feel comfortable, right? You'd have, you'd have felt like, man, he's going to do everything he possibly can, can do in order that Harm will not come to me in that place. They were not happy with that. They say, stand aside. Furthermore, this one has come as an alien. That is Lot. Lot didn't grow up in Sodom. He's come as an alien. You don't belong here. And is already acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them. So now they're about ready to take care of Lot and then do what they originally came for. So they press hard against Lot and came near to break down the door. But the men, that's the angels, reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. They struck the men who were in the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they were worried, and they, that worried themselves trying to find the doorway they couldn't see. And so then it comes about that the two men talk about what's going to happen. I went back this far in the text for today's message so that we could understand the depravity of Sodom and Gomorrah. The wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah.
Lot lived in a town full of evil desires and wickedness, and him and his family lived there. And he longed so much that <clears throat> nothing would come harm to his family, but also to those who stayed with him. But in the end, it was so evil that God sent two angels to destroy the city. I don't know where you stand in this text. But I know that at times, we are going to be surrounded by evil. We're going to be in a place that maybe we long to be there, or maybe we don't long to live there one way or another. But there are going to be things that might happen around us that are just simply evil and wrong. And we're to pick and choose uh, how to follow the Lord and to follow God and his righteousness and not be among those as in not to follow the same actions as those who are sinning and evil that are around us. And we are to protect not only our family, but those that we invite into our life. But a warning comes from these men. And God could have easily probably struck down everybody with, with no concern. But Lot has been found as righteous here and has been warned that it's going to come and has been told to leave. Caleb, I'm going to pick on you. I should pick on Seth, but last time I picked on Seth without you. <laughs> what are you shaking your head for? Last time I picked on Seth without knowing, without being prepared. So if I were to tell you that uh, two angels came into this city and they warned them and said, flee, because destruction is coming, is that law or gospel? Gospel, that's right. God warns us in the same way. Flee. Flee. And don't just go right outside. That's not what's told here, is it? He says, don't just stay in the valley. Go all the way up into the mountains. Get out. Flee. This is our call. The same exact call is to flee the things that would so easily entangle us. All of the evil, wickedness, and sin that we, we desire, that we long to have, it says flee. Don't leave it nearby. If you're not supposed to eat sugars, then it's probably not good to have, you know, candy bars, cookies, pies, all laying out on the counter, right? I know. The thing is, is that I don't really like sugars. So for me, it's best if I don't leave steak, hamburgers, lasagna, those kinds of things out on the counter. The point is this. If you don't intend to buy from the devil's store, don't window shop. If you don't want to buy from the store of Satan, don't be peering in the window. Because I guarantee you there's going to be something in the window that you like to see. It's going to look good to you. That's what windows are meant for, aren't they, in the store? They put the things to catch your eye so that you'll go into the store and spend money. Don't window shop. It's bad news. Because all of a sudden, you're going to find yourself inside the store. And then what you're going to find is you're going to find a sale. Then you're going to find like, oh, I don't just need this, but that's on sale too. And say, um, it's on sale, so I better buy it. Flee! If you see the store, don't walk towards it. Walk away from it.
Lot warns some people of his family, his son-in-laws, and they think he's joking around, so they don't listen. And Lot is almost to the point where he doesn't quite want to leave, right? He, he's, he's reluctant to leave. He doesn't want to be destroyed, I'm sure. He he's finds that they're having favor on him, but what has to happen in order for him to be saved? Did they go before the angels and run out of town? That's not what happened. It says the angels grabbed them by the hands and they led them out of town. Verse 16, but he hesitated, that is Lot. So the men, the angels, seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters for the compassion of the Lord was upon them and they brought them out and put them outside the city. That's a picture of salvation of every kind. The truth is, we don't want to flee. I, you know, I want to be in the comfort sometimes of the things that I dislike to do. The compassion of the Lord will grab you and drag you out of death into life. It will take you from where you're, where you're not wanting to leave and go to where you're leaving. The point is this, I say flee, and I'm going to preach flee over and over and over again, but the truth is, you probably won't want to, and it's a lot easier to go, yeah, he needs to flee, this one over here, I'm, not, I'm okay, this one needs to flee, but in reality, what I'm asking for you to do is to grab a hold of the one who can take you away. Let them seize you. Let Christ seize your hand and guide and lead you away into righteousness rather than staying in the place that will destroy you. Not only will it destroy you because of its sinfulness, but as the Lord judges, you don't want to be in the place of the judgment, right? I had a, jo a joke a lot of times when me and my friends would mess around and, and they were doing something very bad right next to me or saying something blasphemous and, and I would joke and I would say, dear Lord, don't accidentally strike me when you're striking him, right? Or if they were taller, Lord, don't, don't let the lightning go from here to here as it goes down into the earth. The truth is we don't want to be around God's judgment. Get away. So seize the hand of the one who can bring you away. They leave. But in verse 26, it says that his wife from behind looked back and became a pillar of salt. I would love to have said that the reason she was looking back was because of the sight that would have been so awesome to have seen as God's pillar of fire and brimstone rained down from heaven. If you weren't a believer before that, I'm pretty sure you'd be a believer after and it was Paul, I remember, had brought this up one time, that the Dead Sea, he believed and had heard at one time that it was the place where Sodom and Gomorrah had been, and that's where the fire that had come down from heaven had left a hole in the ground. I don't know if that is true or not, but that's an interesting thought. And if fire and brimstone were to rain down from heaven, and it were to come down, I can imagine that it would have left a pretty big divot in the ground there would have been nothing left God's judgment is pure and holy and righteousness and right it's never wrong okay it's not like God walks around and accidentally steps on your toe and you're like ah, ah 
not. And he's like, oh, sorry, didn't see your foot there. If God steps on your toe, he meant to step on your toe. God's righteousness is always right. God's judgment is always right. Because God is never wrong. And I can imagine how bad, as I am fleeing, that I would want to turn around to get a glimpse at the power that was raining down from heaven. I can imagine the sound, right? When the wind gets blowing, you can hear it. When the thunderstorm comes, it gets scary. Can you imagine what it would have sounded like to literally have a pillar of fire coming down that's big enough to engulf a city? What that would have sounded like. I'm sure it would have been sounder, louder than any sound of any jet roar ever. I'm sure it would have made me tremble, probably made me sweat. But Lot's wife didn't look back because of that. She looked back because she didn't want to leave. She didn't want to leave. And I don't understand that. Mothers, if you were in Lot's wife's position, you're in the home, there's a group of men gathered outside, right? Pitchforks, torches, whatever else is happening out there. You can hear them. Right? You can hear the screams. You can hear the yells. And you know that your husband is standing out in front of the door trying to stop them from coming in. And you can probably hear over the muffle the words of Lot offering up your children. To which you probably are like, oh no, he did it. How many of you were like, you know, I think I just want to hang out here a little bit longer. I think I'll stay in this town for the rest of my life because I love it so much. Most of us would be like, get your things packed right now. We're getting out of here. Pull up the wagoneer. We're driving away. But for for his wife, for whatever reason, because it doesn't tell me, she looked back. God says, don't look back. When he says for you to flee the things that are so easily entangling you, he tells you not to look back. God does not save us from a sinful lifestyle, from the sin that so easily entangles us, so that we can go back and wallow in it like pigs. I told the story of my dog who liked to roll in its stink this last Sunday, right? I didn't wash my dog so that she could go back outside and do it again. Don't look back. If you can take anything from today's message, take a hold of Christ's hand that wants you to be saved, that has the power to save you, has the power to lead you out of those things that want to take you away, and let him do so. And in so doing, don't take your eyes off of him ever and don't look back. If you don't have a desire that wants to be wholeheartedly out for Jesus, I think that that's okay. I'm not saying it's good, but I think it's a place we've all been in. I've been in a time with Lord where I didn't know what Lord was doing and quite frankly I didn't think he was fair there was periods of time in my life where I thought oh that's right okay Lord you get credit for everything that good that happens in my life but I have to take credit for all the bad stuff how is that fair well you're stupid Steve that's how it works so but in those times that's how I felt with God we're all in different stages right we're all in different places Some of us, that's all we have is complete surrender to Christ. And there's others of us that haven't quite let go of everything yet. But as we work forward, don't look back. 
Don't look back. Don't hope for the fact that you could be back in the wickedness that you once were. Don't desire that. Do the best that you can to keep your eyes on Christ. Take it from Lot's wife, who was not able to give up that lifestyle. She was not able to give up Sodom and Gomorrah. She didn't want to leave. And so she looked back. Let's pray. Lord, please have your way with us. Grab our hand, Lord. Drag us if you must. Never let go of our hand and save us from ourselves. For we too desire things we ought not. Lord, you've granted us a freedom so that we could do what we should. So let us love you and let us love others. Let us lay aside the things that we should, Lord. Let us do what you ask, and let us leave undone what you ask. So lead and guide us in all ways unto your righteousness, that you may be glorified in all these things. In your holy name, amen. Let's sing our last hymn, Were You There? Or, yeah, Were You There?